worshiping outside here. If, if you're, a, I was just going to mention the chairs. Lynn, you, you sort of illustrated my point. So the chairs, and you know where they are now. Um, if you can help by getting those on the rack and getting the rack back in uh, at the end, thank you as, as always for that help. Deeply appreciated. Um, so that I don't forget about it, uh, just uh, uh, one new one, uh, and that is uh, there are hard copies of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America social statement on abortion that we concluded a three-part study this morning during the faith formation time. And these are extra copies, and so it is something, of course, that's readily available online. But if you, like me, are someone who prefers just to be able to hold something in your hand and read it, uh, this is available, and I'm going to put them over there by the bulletins. Um, also there, as I mentioned quickly last week at the end of worship, are hard copies of the pledge form and giving form for Restoration 250. Uh, no connection, obviously, but they're both there available with the bulletins. Uh, please feel free to take either or both. And with regard to the statement, or, or the giving form for that matter, if you'd have any questions, you know, if you read through it and, and think, well, you know, I didn't make it to the study, but wow, what does this mean? Um, I'd be more than happy at any time to talk with you. You know, feel free to call, stop by, email, whatever is easiest. So I'm going to place those there momentarily. Um, in other announcements, um, tomorrow is the deadline for the September newsletter. Yet another reminder that fall is upon us, basically. So if you do have items to include in the September epistle, please do your best to get those um, ideally to both Rachel and to me uh, tomorrow, the 15th of the month. Uh, note that on Tuesday, my office hours will be different. Uh, because of a medical appointment, I'll be actually getting in later, but then we'll be here, so just FYI kind of thing there. Um, I don't think there was too much. We, we are still in need of a sponsor for our Tree for Hope ministry gift. That is the monthly giving uh, that we share, $50 support for uh, the work that is done. It's, it's both a local ministry through, uh, through Tree of Life Lutheran down on Lingolstown Road, as well as uh, an international ministry working in Guatemala and doing really great things. So if you would be interested in sponsoring that, you can go old school and go in the church at your convenience on the table outside my office is the sign-up sheet and you can write your name on just like back in the day in the foyer, or you can feel free to let me know and I'll be happy to put your name on that, uh, however you would like to do that. There is a note this morning here from Cami and Sheila about the yard sale, uh, a, a really wonderful response. And so, of course, we say a big, big thank you to Cami and to Sheila for another job really, really well done this year. And to all, as they say, to all who helped in any way. Um, there's a note in the bulletin this morning for the first time. We'll run it for a few weeks. Please try to take a look at it about offerings, um, some things that are faithful counters who work very hard week by week by week as offerings come in the mail, get dropped off at the church, and of course are received here on Sunday morning. Some things that they've come across that if you would help with that will make their lives considerably easier and more streamlined. Probably the biggest one, and one that's completely out of our hands, is the first one, uh, which is countersign checks. Now, you may be thinking, gosh, that sounds like a spy thing, countersign, you know. No, what that means is if someone makes a check payable to you and then you in turn endorse it and say payable to St. John Lutheran and place it in the offering plate, um, that's legal per negotiable instrument law. You're talking to the old CPA business law stuff. In theory, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and that would happen, you know, fair, fairly often. Mid-Pen Bank, however, in the security environment in which we're dwelling, uh, they no longer accept checks like that. So though it is legal, strictly speaking, it is also not going to fly. So if you could uh, just be sure to, uh, to not do that, uh, a check again that's been payable to you uh, and then endorsed over, please um, uh, just sadly, you know, deposit it an extra step and hassle, unfortunately, and then write the check. And then the other information is quite self-explanatory. And um, I believe with that, I'm going to hand it over to Judy then for another wonderful prelude as we begin our worship this day.
I knew there was another, if I don't mention it right away, I'm going to forget it, type announcement from this morning or yesterday, actually. Um, I've placed notes at the water uh, faucets out here at the pavilion and in the church restrooms and the church kitchen saying, please don't drink the water. And in case you see one of those and wonder, oh, what's, what's up with that? Uh, a word of explanation is that we were notified yesterday by Pure Test Company, the people that do the required sampling of our water because we're a public water source. Uh, that is something that happens every month required by uh, the State Department of Environmental Protection. Um, we were notified on Saturday that they did find the presence of bacteria in the sample that they took on Thursday. So um, I'm sure that we will be getting um, official state things that say also in effect, don't drink the water. Uh, but until they come, I did want to put my own notes up. Now, I had a big old drink on Friday. So the day after the sample was taken, uh, seem to have had good days. So I mean, no, I'm sorry, that was late on Thursday, just after the sample, Friday we were away, um, just after the sample was taken. And, um, you know, still here, but to be immensely on the safe side, that is the better thing uh, that, that we simply don't drink the water. Possible that there was a contamination in the test, the uh, vessel that they were using, things can go awry a number of different ways. And that's why the state has a whole protocol about how you follow up with subsequent testing and so forth. So stay tuned, but that is uh, what that's about. Not the first time ever, but uh, it's been quite a long time and it will be worked out, but just FYI for the present time. All right then, uh, please stand now as we get to the important stuff of worship to the order for confession and forgiveness in your bulletin once again this morning. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, abounding in steadfast love toward us, healing the sick and raising the dead, showering us with every good gift. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Just and gracious God, we come to you for healing and life. Our sins hurt others and diminish us. We confess them to you. Our lives bear the scars of sin. We bring these also to you. Show us your mercy, O God. Bind up our wounds, forgive us our sins, and free us to love. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. It is the Apostle Paul who assures us that when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ, nailing the record of our sins to the cross. Jesus says to us, your sins are forgiven, and so be at peace and tell everyone how much God has done for us. Amen. And you may be seated as we sing.
God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be with you all. Let us pray. O God, judge eternal. You love justice and hate oppression, and you call us to share your zeal for truth. Give us courage to take our stand with all victims of bloodshed and greed, and following your servants and prophets, to look to the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is taken from the 23rd chapter of Jeremiah. Am I a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long? Will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back? Those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own hearts. They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Let us read responsively Psalm 82. God stands to charge the divine council assembled, giving judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favor to the wicked? Save the weak and the orphan, defend the humble and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor, deliver them from the power of the wicked. They do not know, neither do they understand. They wander about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. The second reading is taken from the 11th chapter of Hebrews. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not per perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God.
Please stand, if you would, as we hear this morning from the Holy Gospel once again in this year of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, once again this week in the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. One of those times yet again where um, saying this is the gospel of our Lord seems like uh, dark humor or irony because, of course, as you know, gospel simply is the translation of a Greek word meaning good news. And um, now the fact that it is good news with a capital G, that's separate. But as far as good news like, yay, not so much. I think you would agree. Um, One of my... um, long distance mentors, because I never have had the honor of meeting him, and hopefully he would be honored, I guess, if he were to know this, but a person who I over the years have uh, thought of as as a mentor through his writings is a retired United Methodist uh, bishop, college professor, pastor, dean of the chapel at Duke University, one of those folks who pretty much has done it all, and that is the Reverend Dr. William Willimon, Uh, who you have heard me reference over the years a goodly number of times, simply because, in my experience, he has so many um, amazingly perceptive things to say about Scripture. And one of the ways in which he has done that is, over the years, preparing commentaries on the lessons which we pastors use for preaching and teaching each week, and just, you know, throwing out thoughts and things that come to his mind because he is, unlike most of us, literally a PhD biblical scholar, in addition to being um, a really wonderful, now retired bishop and pastor. But uh, one of the stories that that he told that I came across recently um, said about in one of his classes at Duke University, where he taught in addition to being dean of the chapel for a number of years, um, he said that it was his custom to start a class dealing with the New Testament by reading a letter. And it was a letter from an angry parent to their local government. Um, And in the letter, the parent was complaining, well, more than complaining, in in outrage, saying that their once um, proper and and prim and obedient and organized and well-motivated son had become involved with some weird religious group and that the group had proceeded to completely take over his life. They had forced him to forsake all of his former friends and even his family. Uh, And so the parent is pleading with their local government to do something, look into this, you know, have a committee, mount a study, intervene in some way. You've got to do something about this obviously dangerous and destructive group that has arisen in our midst and which had caused so much pain and suffering for that family. And then Pastor Willimon, Dr. Willimon said, after reading the letter, he would say, so thoughts, you know, what what do you think, what's the circumstance? What's going on here? What do you hear in this letter? And uh, as, as you might imagine, uh, people would say, uh, you know, I knew a family where, you know, yeah, their their daughter got involved in this weird cult thing. Um, you know, they, they got into Scientology. 
Um, you know, I've heard of the Moonies and the way that they, you know, would separate people from their families and, you know, those kinds of things, this very negative view of a, a cult sort of thing would, would come to mind. And almost no one would realize before his revealing that in fact this was a letter that was a composite of several letters which were written by AD 3rd century Roman parents complaining about this weird cult called the Christians. And, you know, he, he said always, you know, that kind of set a certain tone for what it is that the New Testament really says and the effect that it really has. Um, you may or may not know, you may remember my saying over the years in sermons and in Bible studies that one of the main things that got the Christians in trouble from the standpoint of the Roman Empire, and we've all heard about the persecutions, you know, the, the fact that it, it would come and go, somebody would be in charge and suddenly they would lower the boom on the Christians, they would be uh, persecuted, they would be tortured, they would be killed in spectacular fashion. Then suddenly it would go away for a time. No one ever really quite knew what to think during those early years in the Roman Empire. And one of the things that counted the most against the Christians was the charge that they were anti-society, that they in particular turned people against their families, uh, they turn people against their, their neighbors. You know, how are you going to have a good community if you have this group actively dividing people and tearing people apart? They, they broke up families by encouraging wives, particularly to be disobedient to their husbands, as was supposed to be the case in a well-regulated society. Um, they encouraged disobedience to reasonable requirements of the government. How are you going to have a society, for Pete's sake, if you have people like that running amok? And I guess when you hear words like Jesus utters today, um, you know, you can kind of see where those Roman officials were coming from, right? When uh, one can imagine an aggrieved family, you know, coming in and shoving this fragment of a document in front of a political leader and saying, look, look, you know, this is, this is the kind of stuff that this Jesus of Nazareth that they claim, you know, was raised from the dead. This is the kind of thing that he's teaching. Families divided, three against two, two against three, sons versus fathers, daughters versus mothers, and all the rest. Um, like I said, it doesn't sound like good news on a nice summer morning like this, right? Like, yay, division, disagreement, anger, um, something that we've all had our fair share of familiarity with in recent years, right? Um, but to make a plug for why it is, in fact, still good news, not small g as in yay, but good as in important, and good as in helpful for us to hear and to be aware of. It's worth thinking for a moment that words that might sound like such a downer, such a bummer to us, where we want to picture just everybody getting along and harmony and, and love. Uh, I've told you the story over the years how early in my seminary years in Gettysburg, I was out in the community and met a woman who asked what I did for a living. And I said, well, actually, you know, I'm a student at the seminary, you know, over on the west side of Gettysburg. And, and her reaction, you know, she beamed and said, oh, it must be just so wonderful being a part of a community of all Christians. <laughs> and it had its wonderful parts, but yeah. Heaven on earth, uh, no, not, not so much. But what we need to think about is words that maybe we'd rather not think about and maybe that we find troubling and somewhat hopeless were in fact hopeful words for the first people that would have heard them. Uh, whether they were Jesus' original listeners you know, listening to him teaching as we're here together this morning, 
whether they were perhaps the first readers of this thing called the Gospel of Luke, which pulled together all kinds of teachings and other things to do with Jesus. Because let's just say they were people in their time who would have had some really serious struggles hearing Jesus spoken of as the Prince of Peace, you know, peace on earth, goodwill to all people, the angels say in that Gospel of Luke back at Jesus' birth. And yet looking around themselves and seeing discord and pain because it was an ongoing reality that proper Jewish families, um, who as long as they kind of towed the line, they, they were pretty well under the radar of the Roman officials, but good and proper Jewish families would suddenly in horror have a mother, wife, a father, husband, a son, a daughter, maybe both, who would suddenly start to get involved with this fringe group this fringe group of, of people called Christians. And that being the view of their family, all too often they were given the ultimatum. Look, if you're going to do that, if you're going to be involved with those people, then we don't know what that is, but you're not our son, you're not our daughter, you, you need to leave. That happened in families, that happened in neighborhoods, um, that happened in work settings where, nope, if you're one of them, then I don't, I don't want anything, I don't know you anymore, I don't want anything to do with that. So as people who heard these words of Jesus for the first time were already living that and thinking, good God, what, what's going on here? What, I didn't sign up for this. What, what is this about? How, how can this be? It is for them that Luke records those words of Jesus to say in effect, guys, don't be too surprised. Don't be shocked. It doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. If there is disagreement and, and outright struggle, um, it doesn't mean that somehow you, you've missed something if people are going storming off in, in a huff because of what you believe about Jesus and what he claims for us, it, it shouldn't in fact be surprising because it in fact has been an inevitable part of being his followers from the beginning. They're not the final word, mind you. They're not the end of the story. That's, that's not what is the case. But for now, in this world, in this life, in the current circumstance in which we live, that's the reality. Um, I, I, an image that came to mind for me was um, um, over the years, maybe a movie, a documentary, who knows, but I, I remember seeing someone working uh, metal and I'm thinking maybe what they were doing was, was pounding out uh, a blade for a sword, you know, so maybe a medieval movie or something like that. And, you know, they're pounding, it's white hot. And all of a sudden as a part of the process, they take that white hot blade and poof, stick it in to cold water, uh, tempering or something, I believe, no doubt many of you know much more about that than I. But there's this explosive reaction, like that white hot metal blade hitting the cold water, just this wild sound and light show that takes place. And I'm thinking that maybe that's not such a bad image if we think about how Jesus revolutionary teaching such as we've been hearing over these past weeks for instance in the Gospel of Luke uh, about things like how we use our time how we use our money and the like it's maybe not a bad image for what that looks like when that gospel of Jesus gets plunged into a world that would prefer to go along with other other guidelines other rules other processes, the explosiveness getting played out again and again. Now, I, I kind of think, hello, um, that at one time Jesus' words maybe would have shocked us 
speaking for myself, I guess, let me say, I think, you know, reading these words as we do every three years, right? So maybe going back six, nine, 12 years, let's say, reading these words, um, I think maybe I would have found them more shocking than I do now. And, and I'm just proposing perhaps you find that to be the case as well, that after these past five plus six, seven years under our belts, you know, after pandemic for two and a half plus years and all of the fierce divisions and discord, um, which has played out within our congregational family, of course, not telling you anything you don't already know, and also within our biological families, um, as I know from speaking with many of you over the years, as I know from my own, my own biological family, um, there's been a lot of family member against family member, whoever that happens to be, fill in the blank, that maybe most often finally comes back to what it is we believe about Jesus teaching and his commandments and what they require of us as people who are also citizens of this great nation that is the United States. Because, you know, much as we sometimes hear it said and much as we might sometimes really wish it were so, there's no separating the two. You know, the Bible, Jesus thoroughly intermingle faith and political matters. And so it is for us if, if we're going to walk faithfully. Jesus' words uh, still come in 2022, no less than, say, in AD 22, kind of like that white-hot blade, boom, into a world of sin and injustice and brokenness and our own lives that too often, if we're honest, reflect that, the things done, the things left undone, as we talked about in the confession order a little bit ago. Doesn't mean Jesus is any less the Prince of Peace. You know, the angels got it right there as they were singing in the fields outside of Bethlehem to the shepherds all those years ago. But the peace, you see, isn't, yay, easy, wow, sure, you know, nothing, nothing wrong, happy, happy, like that woman pictured us all there on Seminary Ridge years ago. No, it's, it's a peace with a capital P that confronts the world as it is. It confronts me as I am. It confronts you as you are. And that has consequences. And so because Jesus says, hey, you know, when you find that to be the case, you're not alone. You're not the first. You're not the last. It goes with the territory. It means we don't have to be in despair. Down at times, yeah, you know, probably, right? But we don't give up. We don't lose hope. It's um, sometimes believed by well-meaning people that the Bible um, is out of touch with reality. You know, e even Christian people who, who kind of have the sense that when they read the Bible, um, they're, they're reading like, like holy stuff that's all about God stuff and, and prim and proper stuff and no bad words, no bad feelings, no bad actions. No, it's, it's just kind of this, this pure thing. And that's part, honestly, of why too many Bibles end up sitting on a side table gathering dust or on a bookshelf because it's perceived too often that there's the Bible and that's all about this pie-in-the-sky heaven stuff. And boy, then there's my life and there's the world. And, you know, it, the two don't really have a lot to do with each other. Well, I think you'll agree with me this morning, Jesus pretty much shoots that to pieces. Because Jesus and this book of Luke that records his words is nothing if not brutally honest about the realities of our lives, brutally honest about our world. And in that brutal honesty, well, there's at least a chance that we can be sustained 
and upheld and find hope and even joy and motivation because we know he's the one who went through it all before us and he'll get us through ours. Amen. Uh, if you would, you can go ahead and stand, please, if you're able to do so, as we do several important things now in our worship, responding to the word of God as we've heard it this morning, first of all, by proclaiming together using a part of the Apostles' Creed and Martin Luther's explanation of that, whose we are and who we are. Together, please. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. This means that I believe that God has created me together with all that exists. God has given me and still preserves my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all limbs and senses, reason, and all mental faculties. In addition, God daily and abundantly provides shoes and clothing, food and drink, house and farm, spouse and children, fields, livestock, and all property along with all the necessities and nourishment for this body and life. God protects me against all danger and shields and preserves me from all evil. All this is done out of pure fatherly and divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness of mine at all. For all of this, I owe it to God to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. And now trusting in God's extraordinary love, we come near to the Holy One in prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain your church. Especially this day, we lift up here in our Upper Dolphin Conference, our neighbors at St. Christopher Church in Lycans, and their interim pastor, Dell. We pray for all who dedicate their lives to serving your people. Renew our commitment to our siblings in faith around the globe and bless the work of our ecumenical and interfaith partners. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain your creation. We pray for all places affected by natural disasters, most especially just now, of course, the people of Eastern Kentucky, but not only there with fires, floods, and so many things taking place near and far. Transform the devastation of floods and fires into fertile ground for new life and growth. Fill heaven and earth with your life-giving spirit. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain the nations. Thwart those who would choose to lead in paths of evil and deceit and arrogance. Stay the hand of any intent on violent hate, near or far as the case may be. Please, we pray, Grant peace with justice. Kindle in all elected leaders a desire to administer your justice. Strengthen their resolve to defend those who are vulnerable and to stand publicly against all forms of oppression. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain those who are oppressed. We pray for people harmed by racist discrimination, ableist discrimination, and all people discriminated against based on their gender identity or sexual orientation. Rescue us from all systems that degrade our fellow human beings in any way. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain this congregational family, this assembly of faith. We pray for this community, celebrating with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep standing with and supporting and caring for those dealing with brokenness of any kind, lifting up particularly this day, Judy, Timothy, Jane, Dana, Cora, Lynn, Joyce, Ken, Donna, and these loved ones whom we now call by name before you, O oh God.
In our joy and in our tears, be near us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we remember the saints, especially Maximilian Kolbe and Kai Monk, who have gone before us. May we run with perseverance the race set before us until we find our rest in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, who is our wisdom and who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now as we soon go forth from this time of worship, may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord's face shine upon us with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. As you're seated for the closing hymn, one last of those announcements that I knew, last minute things I would forget if I didn't say them right away, please be seated, uh, is to, to say we are delighted today to have with us Katie Gessner, uh, who of course for quite some time now has been living in Western Canada, uh, more recently returned home now to Northern York County, and uh, she's here today with her grandpa Larry, though not here here, she is in the church right at the moment uh, with Miss Laurie, helping Miss Laurie, uh, which she dearly loves to do. But uh, you'll no doubt as I be seeing her in the weeks ahead, and we are indeed delighted and give thanks uh, that that is once again the case. So now we sing. Thank you to Judy for the excellent music as always. Thank you to Kim for filling in as lector today for uh, Gary who is unavailable as our August lector. And uh, thank you to you all. Um, as we go forth, thank you in advance to the people who uh, would be willing to help get those chairs back where they need to be. And um, with that, hear the dismissal. Go in peace, proclaim the good news. We will 
Thanks be to God.